Hello and welcome everybody. Um, good to see you all here. It's exciting to welcome you to this EIT Food Accelerator Network Demo Day, uh, where we're going to be talking about agri-food tackling the climate crisis. Um, so my name is Ryan Edwards and I'm here with my co-founder Laurie Tan from uh, Naked Innovations. Hi everyone. And we're going to have, uh, we've got a great program today, some amazing uh, expert speakers and uh, six really uh, impactful startups from the EIT Food Accelerator Network, um, which we're happy to uh, share with you shortly. But before we do that, we want to talk a little bit about this platform we're on, just so everyone feels comfortable, right, Larry? Yeah, it's exciting. So this year we have a new platform, it's Hop In, as you, can, you have seen in your email. Uh, so this platform has a few functionalities that you may have not seen before if you've not used Hop In. So it's not like the Zoom that we're used to normally. It's a bit more dynamic. So you'll see on your right, there is there are a few icons that will kind of guide you to different places during this expo. Uh, first of all, there's a stage which you should be on right now, listening to us, um, and you see us clearly, hopefully. Uh, and then there's another section called networking, where during the whole event, you'll actually be able to network with people that you meet. Uh, on the left, you'll see actually there's people. And so there, you can actually connect with them and move over to the networking session if you feel you to see some connection there. Um, so that networking session is open throughout the whole three hours. So you can actually go and connect there when anytime you want. And then finally, then you'll see the expo sec section, which is obviously an important part, uh, where later um, at about 3.30, there will be, or a bit later at four o'clock, we'll tell you when that happens, uh, there'll be the expos of the startups. So there you have to hand, hand, head over to that section where uh, startups will be demonstrating their videos that they've created and also be able to have some Q&A with the startups. Um, so yeah, that's the platform. It's pretty simple. Hopefully it's quite intuitive for you all and you'll be able to understand where to go and where to navigate. Yeah, and just to let you know, throughout the whole event, we want to be have this event as interactive as possible. So we'll be doing some polls and you'll be able to see that on your left side again, there's a poll section where we will be indicating when the polls are happening, uh, where you can answer some questions for us and we can then share that with the wider audience. Um, and in general, we want you to interact as much as possible. We want to connect you. Uh, we're going to have some networking sessions where we'll connect you to some, some different people, random people that you may never have connected before, uh, because we want to create those connections that you're not used to. OK. Great. Well, let's get into it. And we have our first uh, speaker here. This is Dr. Christoph Mandel, who is the head of EIT Food Accelerator Network. Hi, Christoph. Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much. Great to see you and uh, great to see so many people attending our first EIT Fan Demo Day this year. Yeah, absolutely. So before we actually start, just for those that maybe don't know EIT Food yet, and uh, there might be a few out there, um, could you actually explain what it is EIT Food does? Who are you guys? Yeah, it's a tricky one, but I give it my <laughs> best try. Um, so EIT Food is Europe's leading open innovation community. We have meanwhile more than 200 academic, research and corporate partners in our network, all working towards one mission, that is to make our food system more sustainable, trusted and healthier. We have offices spread all around Europe, allowing us to be very close to our partners locally, but at the same time giving us true, true pan-European reach. What I personally personally really like about ERT Food is that it looks at how to foster innovation from many different angles, right? So for instance, we support educational initiatives ranging from summer schools, online learning, degree awarding master's programs, all the way to certified professional education. We support collaborative innovation projects for tech and products that are really close to market introduction. And a little side note here, we have just this week uh, launched our call for innovation projects, uh, which you can learn all about on the ERT Food website. At ERT Food, we believe in the transformative power of entrepreneurship to help solving these huge challenges that we face in our food system today. This is why we support agri-food entrepreneurs at various different, different growth stages as part of our business creation activities, starting from the very early entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial teams that we help um, with market validation. For them, we have the Seedbed Incubator. For the more advanced companies that are looking to pilot their solution with, uh, within partners or from our network and try to to get to pilot projects, uh, commercial agreements, or any other sort of partnerships, we have the uh, EIT Food Accelerator Network. And finally, 
We have also something for the scale-ups uh, that are looking for market adoption and to scale internationally. We have basically a network within the network that we call the Rising Food Stars Association. Since 2020, EIT Food has also started to actively invest in companies. Um, in 2020, it was in total 10 million euros uh, that we invested in companies across all the three different growth stages. In addition, we have also started to actively match make startups participating in our programs with industry and facilitate and moderate the whole collaboration process. At the, at, um, and we have been very fortunate, actually, in FAN, yeah, that we could actually pilot the whole corporate matching aspect uh, this year. And judging by the feedback we've received so far, it was really very, very positive and, and, and successful. One of the questions uh, that I also wanted to address is, um, yeah, it has been a very challenging year, 2021, and there have been obviously some, still some challenges around COVID-19. So I just want to quickly share also one of my key takeaways uh, that I had this year. Um, yeah, first and foremost, I would like to thank all partners and all startups making the ERT Fan 2021 this great success, yeah? but despite the COVID-19 pandemic, and all the associated craziness that came along with it. I feel um, everybody's very much aware that this has certainly not been an easy one. So even, even uh, that's why I'm even more grateful about all the efforts and all the uh, great outcomes that we've seen over the past few, 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 few weeks. Um, thinking specifically of key takeaways, I believe it's definitely um, the importance of connecting the dots, right? So EIT FAN is running in parallel across six different accelerator hubs spread across Europe. In each of our hubs, we've been working together with partner organizations who are very well connected in the region. Unternehmer to Maxpreneurs, for instance, in Munich, um, VTT in Finland or the Technion in Israel. And although the program is delivered very much tailored to the local ecosystem and the needs of the participants locally, I feel that COVID-19 allowed us to start building bridges between the different hubs, um, the different innovation ecosystems a lot quicker than originally anticipated. So um, thanks, uh, thanks to delivering parts of the program online, I feel that borders became less and less relevant. And this is super important to me, to us, because the ambition of ERT Fan has never been to build yet another accelerator program, right? but rather to bring like-minded innovators who are working on similar challenges together. For instance, here in our EIT Fan demo days, yeah, but also during our side tracks that we hosted this year, for instance, on sustainable agriculture and healthy nutrition. So to me, it was really great to see the value that EIT Food and its extensive network can bring to the European startup ecosystem by connecting the dots between the different hubs, the different ecosystems, but also by connecting and matching impactful agri-food startups and world industry. Mm. As a quick last note on um, yeah, maybe my expectations today, right? Yeah, so um, today we are obviously focused on the super important issue of the climate crisis yeah? and how agri-food has a major role to play in that. At ERT Food, we focus on empowering impactful startups that scale to make a difference. And I'm very much looking forward to hear from a few of them today. Already in advance, a big, big thank you to them and all of our speakers who are with us today and sharing their insights. So over to you, Ryan. Thanks. Hey, well, thank you. Uh... Hi. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Christoph. Um, it's really cool to hear that and see all the amazing things that Food Accelerator Network are doing across Europe and, and actually um the, the diversity from really from farm to fork as, as we say um across the supply chain there okay so i think uh, we'll move on now to our first uh, poll so the first uh, poll is live i believe which is we wanted to get the audience interaction. So we're trying to see what are the sustainable factors are you considering when you are buying food and drink, uh, the beverages? Try and be honest on this one. We're interested to hear what your thoughts are. And um, after that, we'll have our keynote speech. 
So the um, the direct poll um, is on the segment on the side of Hopin. So if you click on the poll there, you'll see the question I just asked, and you'll be able to easily give your responses. So as, um, as you're answering that poll now, we're going to set up and move forward with um, the keynote speech from our, um, well, our keynote speaker, Antonis. So um, we have here uh, Antonis uh, Mavro Mavropolis. Um, he is the founder and CEO of D-Waste. Uh, he's been involved for 25 years now across 30 countries in EU-funded and development assistant projects, always relevant to the environmental protection and resource management space both in the public and private sector. Uh, he's well known for his innovative approaches to these uh, problems that we see. Very topical right now with, with COP26 happening, of course, in Glasgow. Um, so he's really focused on how we integrate social and economic uh, dimensions, as well as working in the uh, Industry 4.0. Um, he's actually recently authored a book called Industry 4.0 and in Circular Economy. Um, and yeah, I think we'll hear uh, from him now. Um, so over to you, Antonis. Good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure and my honor to share some thoughts with you about the next big thing after climate change, the next big thing after we will be able to manage the pandemics, the urgent necessity to redesign food. I will share some thoughts with you about the food industry in brief, the food system and its environmental footprint, the importance of food waste and food losses, and finally, the challenges of the future. And I hope by the end of this presentation that I would be, I would be able to, to persuade you that we have to rethink and redesign the whole food system rather than optimizing or finding partial solutions for that. We need a serious systemic and systematic research and innovation to create a new food system worldwide. Let's start with the food industry in brief. The food industry is probably the biggest industry in the world, at least in terms of employment. Already, it has more than 1 billion employees only in the agricultural sector. Some estimations say that the total employment in the food industry is very close to 1.5 billion, which means roughly 40% of the total employment in the world. The global food and beverages market was roughly $6 billion in 2019, and it is expected to double by 2030, rising with an annual rate of roughly 6%. So we are talking about an industry that really determines not only what to eat, but also the whole global economy. Now, let's talk about the footprint of this industry, the environmental footprint of the food system. The environmental footprint of the food system is really remarkable and very, very, very important for the future. The food system contributes with one third of the whole greenhouse gases emissions. It contributes to 50% of human induced pressures to biodiversity. And finally, the food system is responsible for 80% of the deforestation that's happening in the planet. If we're going to go further in the environmental impacts, you will see besides what you already said, that 50% of the land use changes in the world are happening due to the need to produce new food. And 70% of the global freshwater withdrawals are due to food cultivation. Finally, 78% of the global ocean and freshwater pollution due to eutrophication is due to the food industry. So we are talking about a huge impact on our planet, on our ecosystem, on our environment. And although we discuss a lot about how better it is local food comparing to others, 
I think some of you might be surprised if you learn that the transportation emissions of food are just a tiny fraction and more than 90%, sometimes 95, is the emissions from farming and processing the food and changing the land uses. So local food is always better in terms of less emissions, but it concerns only the last part of the supply chain. The big part of the, of the emissions of the greenhouse gases emissions are coming from farming changes in land uses and manufacture. Now, another thing of interest of importance for our work is the food losses and the food waste. The food waste and food losses are very important because due to them, first we have a missed opportunity to feed the growing population in hunger. And second, we have a huge pressure on natural capital. Right now, we know well that we lose annually roughly 2.5 billion tons of food, which is roughly one third of the total food produced. One third of the total food produced never comes to a consumer. The direct cost of the food waste in market prices is close to $1 trillion. But if you consider also the indirect costs, like the costs of greenhouse gases emissions, the cost of biodiversity, the cost of land uses, the cost of pollution, then the total cost of the food we waste is roughly $12 trillion per year, including direct costs, health, economic and environmental impacts. Now, why we are losing so much food? There are different explanations for different parts of the world. As an example, in developing countries, we lose roughly one third of the food supply mainly due to poor practices in harvesting and logistics and lack of proper infrastructure for transportation and storage. In the rich world, on the other side, we lose one third of the food that is produced, a lot of it at the consumer phase due to overshopping and due to bad consumption habits and poor planning and in many cases due to bulk purchasing. So the way we will reduce food wastage is completely different to rich and poor countries. Now, if we're going to have the big idea about how we lose food in different parts of the supply chain, the average losses during the field and harvesting is about 20%. During storage, we lose also 20% more. Then during waste processing, we lose 5 to 20%, and during transportation, 5 to 10, 15. Finally, at the market, the waste is about 10 to 15 percent, and all of these percentages are in calorific value. Obviously, there is a huge challenge to reduce this food wastage and use the lost food to manage the growing hunger. Okay, that was the picture in brief of the current uh, size and importance of the food industry and its environmental footprint. How about the food challenges? I think here we have to be very frank. The food challenges are the most important challenges for the next 20, 30 years because they will determine not only how we will feed all the world and we will avoid hunger, but also, as I will explain, they will determine the future of greenhouse gases emission. So challenge number one is about productivity. Humanity would require 80% more food by 2000. The Sustainability Development Goal 12.3 says that at least we have to cut by 50% the food waste per capita worldwide and the food losses. The food demand by 2015 will be 40% more in cereals and 65% more in, in meat comparing to 2010. So the issue of productivity is a big challenge if we want to keep the current population out of hunger. The second big challenge is resilience. What we noticed during the COVID-19 crisis is that hunger increased due to problems and disruptions of the supply chains. There is an estimation that in 2020, Roughly 100 million people more worldwide got into hunger because of the disruption that COVID-19 brought. 
as the future is going to be full of crisis and pandemics, which will be the new business as usual, the resilience of the food systems becomes a very crucial element to sustain, to feed the whole world. And speaking about feeding the whole world, right now we have 185 million people under food insecurity. 25% of the world's children are stunted and 66 million children go to school every day hungry. One sixth of the children in developing countries are underweight, while 20% of the children in developed countries are overweight. So we cannot ignore the challenge of hunger in our efforts to regenerate, to redesign the food sector. And then besides productivity and resilience, there is a third challenge which is about emissions. I don't want to get deeply into numbers, but I will tell you this to understand how important is the food sector. If we continue with the business as usual in terms of emissions, then by 2000, the emissions of the food sector will cover all the gap that is necessary to be filled in order to avoid the climate disaster. So it means that if we keep all the other sectors in control and we lose, we lose control on the emissions from the food sector, this is enough to destroy the Paris Agreement. This is enough to drive humanity above the threshold of two degrees and, create, and, and transform the climate crisis to climate disaster. So the aim is to keep the emissions roughly to one third of the business as usual scenario which means we will have to produce almost double food with one third of the emissions. You understand that this is really a huge challenge for all of us in the sector. Another detail of interest here, as I told you, a lot of the emissions are related to land uses and loss of biodiversity. Now, we know well that in the U European Union and the UK, roughly 40-45% of the agricultural land is really influenced and controlled by the 10 most important fast-moving consumer goods companies and retailers. That means if we are able to influence and change the patterns of production from these retailers and companies, we will be able to reduce substantially the greenhouse gases footprint of the food sector. Okay, so what is the solution to all of that? The solution is not simply to optimize things. The solution is not to continue thinking in boxes and in each box to try to optimize the performance in harvesting, in uh, consumers, in restaurants, in retailing. We have to think out of the box. I would say that we have to get rid of the box. And the box is that we continue to correlate the growth of the food sector with its growth in terms of monetary value. We cannot completely disconnect them, but we have to find a way to produce more food and better food without the increasing impacts of the food sector. How to do that? We have two practical tools for that. One of them is the rise of Industry 4.0 in the food system and food waste management. Using the advances of the Industry 4.0, we are now able to connect all the food supply chains worldwide create new interfaces and control losses and waste in time. I would say that we are also able to control a lot of the pollution created by the food system. So Industry 4.0 combined with circular economy is creating a new unique framework that is capable to deliver new solutions. Besides that, using the advances of Industry 4.0 circular economy, it's time to redesign the whole food system. It's time to think about the diversity of the seeds, about regenerative agriculture, about low impact production and cultivation, and about upcycling of the food waste. I would say that the challenge is to redesign the food system and task at least the fast moving companies, uh, consumer goods, to create ambitious and well resourced action plans to make natural positive products to create a new collaborative dynamic and interaction with farmers, to develop iconic products that are on the way 
to showcase the potential of circular design of food, to contribute and and use common on-farm metrics and definitions, and finally, to advocate for policies, for global policies, that support a natural positive food system. I know this is too difficult, but there is no time to be lost. We have rapidly to go beyond optimization. We have rapidly to rethink, reimagine, and adapt the food system in the new world. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Antonis. Um, very strong and uh, clear and powerful message there. Um, it really made me reflect on, I know that we have issues, but uh, there's a lot to be done. Um, so, and I think actually, when you look at the people who are in this room right now in the audience, you know, most of us are, are in positions where we can influence what's happening in agriculture and the food industry. And it's one of the reasons that EIT uh, food Accelerator Network exists, right? So um, we'll hear from some of the, the panelists shortly. Um, one thing is we had the poll earlier, just looking at the uh, the results of that from all of you. <clears throat> the clarity was uh, the majority of you, when you are thinking of what to buy in food and drink, you think about the packaging. Um, I think that's kind of the obvious one that most of us do. Some of us think about the greenhouse gases as well and some on animal welfare and maybe the food miles. Not so much thinking about the land usage, no one really voted for that, or, or even the workers' uh, conditions, the workers' rights. Interesting to, to see what we consider. There's a, lot to, there's a lot to think about, right? There's a lot, it's a complex, complex thing, agriculture and food industry, um, made, we're making these decisions. Okay. Yeah. So since you love that poll so much, uh, we decided to give you another one. Um, so we're now gonna, we've now launched another poll, as you may see on your right-hand side. Um, so this one's a, an easy one. I think it's an easy yes, no. It's an easy to say yes, no, and, or unsure, but the actual question is quite a difficult one. Um, so the question is, is the agri-food industry capable of transformation in order to significantly lower its greenhouse gas emissions while feeding an ever-growing global population? So not an easy question, an easy answer, maybe, when you put the yes or no or unsure. Um, obviously, Anthony's talked about that now. We're at a breaking point right now so how can we can we actually do this can the agri-food industry obviously lots of people here are in the food industry so do you believe that we can turn it around as a collective as a system um yes no or unsure that's uh, up to you so that question think about that question and then try to answer as clearly and as honestly as possible but while you do that i would like to introduce you uh, to the, actually the panelists uh, that we have today um, so I'm going to quickly introduce you, just a, a very high overview of who they are, and then they actually they will be introducing themselves um, to to everyone. So basically, we have on the on the I have a nice picture there of, of them here. Um, so we have uh, George Rush uh, from Yarrow Growth Ventures. He's the he's from and that's the arm of the CBC arm of Yarrow International. Antonis, you already heard from, uh, so you all know who he is now. Uh, then we have uh, Vasilis Stenos, he's uh, the co-founder of Sommelier, um, a startup from the FAN um, setup. Uh, and then we have Jessica Sinclair Taylor, who's from Feedback, who are a UK-based organization campaigning for uh, a change in, in how the food system is working today to a much more climate friendly. Okay, so those those are the four panelists. I believe we may be uh, missing out on one. Um, we may be missing out on um, Facility may be joining us a bit late. Um, so I think it'd be, let's try to get, bring in the panelists um, and see where, let's see if they can introduce themselves. So let's to kick off with Jessica Sinclair um, Taylor. Um, it'd be great if you could introduce yourself and, uh, you know, tell us how, so tell us why you're here, I guess. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, my name is Jessica. I'm a campaigner um, and I work for Feedback, which is a, global campaign group that is based in the UK and also in the EU. Um, and we, in, in essence, campaign for food that is better for people and better for the planet. I think Antonis gave a, um, a rousing outline of the ways in which the food system is breaching almost every sustainability barrier and frontier that there is on land use, on nature degradation, species loss, and of course, as we're hearing a lot about this week and next week 
on climate change. And feedback takes an evidence-based, a research-based view of how we can tackle these systemic global issues, but also um, a power-based view as well. Uh, we work on issues including food waste, animal feed, meat, aquaculture, and bioenergy. And because food is also fundamentally about people, um, we work with communities on social justice projects and food citizenship projects. And um, what I'm interested in today is not just the question of how food systems need to change, because I think we're all clear um, both that they need to change and on the how, but on in what are the structures that are going to enable those changes? What are the business models? What are the policies? What are the regulatory frameworks? What are the incentives that are going to create a food system that's better for people and much better for the planet? Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Great. So um, next, uh, we're going to introduce George Roche from Yada, Growth Ventures. Great. Hey, it's a pleasure being back. And uh, so, uh, yeah, Yara Growth Ventures is the corporate investment uh, team within Yara International, which is a Norwegian based crop nutrition company. Um, and effectively, Yara Growth Ventures just started this year uh, in order to invest in funds and in startups directly both in green hydrogen and in agriculture. Uh, within agriculture, our core thesis is no compromise farming. And by that, we mean if we take to be true that, that farmers and farm advisors and stakeholders in the existing supply chain are going to be willing to compromise on profit in order to meet sustainability demands. Uh, but those sustainability demands are coming regardless. And what are those investment areas that we can uh, drive disruption? And so that's that's pushing us to invest in uh, new biologicals, especially around plant resilience, uh, because we don't necessarily see the, the same lines differentiating between nutrition and protection uh, as, as, as we have in the past. Um, that's leading us to invest in things around digital agronomy and, and digital agriculture for uh, decision-making, um, supply chain optimization across the supply chain, and new means of financing around insurance and, and credit or grain marketing. Uh, all with that red thread of, of sustainability. So happy to talk through some of the ways that we're thinking about uh, investment opportunities as, as well as uh, how we're evaluating uh, kind of potential impact. Great. Thank you, George. Hi, me. And we have also Vasilis Stenos from Somalia. So uh, do you want to have a, introduce yourself quickly, Vasilis? Well, this is, uh, and to this we already know, we already know. <laughs> so uh, can I? So um, thank you also very much for having us. I'm Vasilis, I'm an environmental and agricultural engineer, and I'm also the founder of Solmeja. Uh, Solmeja is an impact investment agribiotic venture dealing uh, with vertical microalgae farming with the, optimal, with the ultimate goal of fixating as much CO2 as possible and convert this into suitable uh, raw materials for food and feed applications as protein isolates, as well as high value biomolecules ranging from carbohydrates, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and very rich amino acid profiles. We do this in a way that we take uh, 29 to the size forest of the US or the EU just by growing our algae vertically, both heterotrophically, mixotrophically, and of course, autotrophically. Thank you, Vesalis. Okay, so we have the panelists here. Um, just before we hit the panel discussion, I'm just going to go back to the poll. Um, so if anyone can look on their right, I guess, and you can click on their on the poll results. So it looks like we're all pretty optimistic, which is quite it's great to see. Um, not on all, always like, optimistic about the future, but it looks like a whopping 68% of you believe that we can turn it around. So that's great. And so I think um, let's head into the discussion and see whether the panelists also agree with this, with this uh, optimism. Um, so I'm gonna kick off, obviously, COP26 is happening right now. Everyone should be aware of it right now. It's all over the news. Uh, there's a lot lot happening um, around COP26. Um, I believe uh, feedback are very much involved in COP26 right now. Um, you have a few events going on. Um, Karina, uh, your um, managing director, is actually at COP26 next, next week uh, making a speech. So how important is COP26 right now? Um, obviously, people are saying it's a, a defining event for humanity. Um, is it that defining? Um, and the role of the agri-food industry, um, how is that 
taking into consideration when when the negotiations are ongoing right now among the politicians. Um, tell me a bit more, Jessica, about the role of of, um, of feedback here and and what you think is happening in COP26 in regards to agri-food. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, defining, I think we all have to take the defining role of COPs with a little pinch of salt, don't we? Otherwise we would <laughs> despair every year when they don't quite reach the lofty standards that we set for them. But it's undoubtedly the case that um, food systems have really been coming up the agenda in the climate world over the last, well, over the last couple of years, but certainly I've seen that accelerating over the last year and the last six months. You know, a few months ago, we had the UN Food Systems Summit, a very controversial event from a civil society perspective. It turns out COP is also proving quite controversial lots of um, problems with representation and who is being seen and heard at the negotiations. Um, but I think beyond that, what's interesting to me is that we really haven't yet kind of breached this barrier where food systems go from being an issue that's primarily kind of civil society, um, individuals, business led um, into a, a policy issue and one that's on an international climate policy agenda. And that's something that's been a feedback priority for the last um, three COPs, starting from a campaign for um, uh, for politicians and climate diplomats to, re to recognise the cow in the room, the role of um, excessive meat consumption in, in driving kind of global sustainability issues. Um, but what is has been interesting for me this week is that the breakthroughs that we have seen at COP, or the kind of potential breakthroughs that we've seen, on the methane, the global methane pledge that was announced by President Joe Biden earlier this week, and then the deforestation agreement also announced this week uh, to halt and ultimately reverse deforestation. All of these are really about food. You know, they're about other issues as well, but methane, 40% of global methane emissions come from agriculture, more than from fossil fuels. Deforestation, as Antonis demonstrated to us, primarily driven by the expansion of the agricultural frontier. So it's interesting that food policy and climate policy still haven't really made that kind of connection. Um, and I think also questions about climate finance and how countries are gonna to adapt to the ongoing impacts of, of climate change um, are really also about food systems because uh, we're already seeing the impacts of climate change on those food systems. Um, and yeah, we're seeing a lot from, from corporates in terms of pledges, which kind of run the gamut from quite serious sounding pledges to some that are a bit more gimmicky. I got contact, contacted to comment on a, a net zero Mars bar, a chocolate bar <laughs> earlier this week. Um, and I yeah, can go into more details of that example if people are interested. But I think what feedback and what other NGOs are continuing to call for is this, this shift from stuff needs to change to, okay, how are we gonna change it? And what is the role of global policy and national policy in doing that? Great, great. Um, do you believe those agreements that have been made this week around deforestation and methane are actually going to, because obviously they, these are not, um, they're not tied to these agreements. So do you feel that they're going to actually happen? Is this something that, what is there more that needs to be committed to uh, in order to actually make these changes happen? Or? Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course, <laughs> they need to be binding. Um, yeah. They need to be put into law, into regulation. There's been deforestation agreements before, which have roundly not resulted in any mm. reductions in deforestation. And the corporate commitments that we see on deforestation have also not resulted in any reductions in deforestation, or they've merely displaced deforestation from one part of the supply chain, from one geographical area to another. So I think, you know, we're seeing that global leaders know that they have to do more and are are trying to give the impression of doing more you know it depends on how cynical you are <laughs> um but what we aren't seeing is the accountability mechanisms that are going to ensure that those kind of commitments come into being okay so you mentioned corporates there, and I'm going to bring George into the conversation because it's also something that Antonis spoke a lot about in his presentation, the importance, and you mentioned Mars creating a, a Mars bar of a <laughs> net zero. Um, so, George, I mean, in your role sort of um, seeing, being part of a multinational corporation as well, you know, what actions do you see these agri-food businesses uh, currently taking 
And where do you see them going? You know, what should they be doing more of, do you believe? Yeah, it's a good question, I guess. Um, so just to reiterate, I guess it's like, what are, what are the initiatives that are currently happening and what, what needs to change or be, be done more? Um, yeah, there's there's a lot. I mean, I, I, I've, I, if you look at the, the budget gaps in terms of what's required uh, to actually meet the Paris Climate Agreement relative to what's actually being spent, it's... Uh, uh, in the trillions, the gap uh, every year annually, and, and the, the more that's deferred, the bigger that gap becomes. So, I mean, in, in short, the answer is that uh, more on all fronts. Um, and so, while I, I wouldn't necessarily speak to, to all the initiatives that that Yara as a company has, um, I, I can of course speak to the uh, Yara Growth Ventures as a as a strategic tool to help drive. Um, uh, and spur innovation across the industry because that's, that's part of our core mission at Yara Growth Ventures is not just uh, kind of the future proofing or, or, or helping be a strategic tool to Yara International and driving financial return, but also to drive and help spur the innovation across the industry. And I think we're, we're seeing a lot more money going into corporate venture uh, capital with that, with that thread of sustainability um, as, as a key driver. Um, so, I mean, I think it, the, the innovation really has to come from, I guess, the, the different stages of, of looking and, and being introspective about what are the direct emission impacts from your, from your direct uh, uh, company, from your direct supply chain, and then what are the secondary effects of, um, of, of your business and, and the emissions that come from there. So, and those are kind of three tiers. And so if you're, I think more and more of these organizations that, that can actually do the um, public commitments related to the decarbonization of their entire supply chain, then that's, uh, uh, that's gonna be beneficial for the, the whole world. And so, um, yeah, in short, I guess you just need to, just need more, just more, more across the board, uh, yeah. Is there no, so just to, sorry, um, is there enough investment in innovation to combat the climate crisis in agri, particularly in the agri food industry? So obviously we see if you look in the energy industry, um, like especially yeah. solar power, power, there's huge amount of investment went into solar power, and now we see the costs drop ma massively. So in terms right. of the equivalent of that in, in the agri food industry, do, are we seeing that invest, type of investment, um, or is there more to be done? I'd say there's, there's certainly more to be done. There, I mean, you're seeing more venture capital funds uh, funding than ever before. Um, in part, that's driven by, by low interest rates because, and then, you know, that being very much uh, kind of risk on environment. Um, and, and of course, venture capital benefits from that, just as an entire industry. And then you're seeing agriculture specifically getting a lot more interest in it. Um, from a venture investment perspective because of the environment, because of the ESG implications. And so you have a lot of these uh, multinationals and you have a lot of financial institutions that are looking to um, have a direct tie to ESG initiatives. And that's a, an easier story to tell in, in the agriculture space. Whereas traditionally, I think the agriculture industry was probably a little bit more uh, neglected because of the kind of the harsh reality of the industry. You know, it's got slow adoption cycles, um, you know, kind of uh, a lot of products that are used like once a year at, at best. Um, and so, um, and, and it's a pretty low margin business you know, across the entire value chain. It's a pretty low margin business relative to other industries. So it, it doesn't necessarily have the same inherent characteristics that would be beneficial to strong financial return, but from an ESG perspective and an ESG lens, um, I think that's what it's garnering, all, of course, a lot more attention now than it ever has been. And, and the answer is yes, of course, there, there needs to be, needs to be more. Is that leading to some inflated prices and, and uh, uh, being kind of like an entrepreneur driven, founder driven market? Yes. Um, will we see some blow ups? For, absolutely. Um, but all that being said, I mean, that, that, whatever can be done to 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those morons, you know, so I'm just, just throw some more on here. And, um, yeah, I'd like to see, I'd like to see even more capital, uh, come into our industry. Certainly. Okay. So where, where do we think, I don't know, Jessica or, um, Antonis, do you, where should the money be coming from? Do we expect invest, investment capital to be the ones actually putting the money up or should it be now coming more from the public sector? Um, what are your thoughts? When should we be driving investment? Uh, I think this is the billion dollar question. And uh, when I'm talking for billion dollar questions, I'm talking about them literally. Um, I'm sure you're aware of that. There was a great report uh, from the Commission on Sustainable Agriculture uh, Intensification about the research and innovation funds required to transform the food system and reduce its emissions. Uh, the scope of the report was to cover both the need to control the emissions as a key condition to avoid a serious climate crisis, and second, to feed the gap uh, about uh, hunger. So the report came out that we need for the next 10 years an annual investment of at least $15 billion in research and innovation on food and agriculture, which means uh, about $150 billion investments in research and innovation by 2030. Now, how close are we to this? I think we are still far away. Uh, at least from the data I have, on a global scale, the relevant investments are less than 30% of them. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not so much in this field as you are, but uh, having read, read the report, I also guess that this money are rather a conservative estimation on the low end. A more realistic one would be on 20 billion. Now, the question is how this money should be available to the ones that need them, the ones that can deliver innovation. My, my answer is this. I think the main problem we have, and this is also, uh, this is also relevant to the discussion on COP. The main problem we have is that the efforts from top down, as they know the ones by governments and uh, the United Nations and COP, and the efforts bottom up, still they are not met in the proper way. Bottom up and top down efforts to food and food research and innovation are still away. And there are very few cases in successful examples where governmental policies really result in flourishing innovation and research and innovative startups met some policy targets and get some extra uh, support from the governments. So I, I, to put it in, a, in another way, the worst signal of the gap between what is necessary for food and what the governments expect and can support from that, the worst example is what was happening in COP26. COP, uh, COP the food sector as a problematic relevant to carbon uh, emissions and climate change was really absent. Very few things were mentioned officially, very few workshops uh, comparing to other ones happened, as far as I know, because I'm not there, but I watch the news. So I believe we need new types of public-private partnerships. Uh, Public-private partnerships are very well tested in many, many different types of infrastructure, in many different types of services. It's time to use them to deliver new food systems and radical innovation. And this type of partnerships have to be uh, subject of specially designed programs, both by the UN, the European Union, the World Bank. It's time to give the food sector the importance it has not only for feeding the world, but also for avoiding climate disaster. That's my my view in brief. Okay. Cool. Um, Jesse, do you, do you want to say something? Oh. Yeah, I, I just I um, agree with a lot of what Anthony said, especially on um, 
the need for more public-private partnerships and kind of shifting the balance of power in the food system um, where decisions are made. I also think it's important to think about not only where the money comes from, but where it goes to. Um, I'm involved in a, a global campaign to question the um, use of public funds from major public development banks like IDB Invests or the World, Bank, the World Bank's IFC, going to um, companies like Marfrig or like JBS, who are among the kind of worst culprits for uh, the environmental impacts of the food that they produce. Um, and often that kind of channeling of public funds happens in the name of social development. It's kind of a job creation, generating value, um, in, uh, improving, scaling up local economies. But I think we really need to question those assumptions about who can make best use of this money and um, what kind of support vehicles are needed for new types of business model. So there's an approach called the Cleveland model in the US, which is about using public procurement from kind of anchor institutions in a region like universities, hospitals, schools, uh, prisons, to develop local food models, local food communities to support local and regional businesses that keep more um, nutritional and financial value in a region uh, and bring more kind of local development. But what you also need alongside the money is support to those kind of businesses and cooperatives to develop because it's a, you know, it's a long way up, especially when you're competing with the likes of say Sodexo for a school meal contract. Very cool, nice. Yeah, so it's not all about startups, right? It's also that there's lots of different initiatives going across. Um, sometimes there's a big focus on startups. Obviously, FAN is supporting the startup ecosystem here in Europe. Uh, but then there's, there is the other sections of, of the economy that where there isn't, uh, there's SMEs, there's there's local initiatives that will need that support. And these kind of, would I think there's a, there's a question about measurement here, right? Um, and where that money goes and what, is actually, what kind of impact actually is making. I think there's maybe a little gap there. Um, I just want to bring on in Vasilis into this conversation. Um, how how do you feel as a obviously a budding entrepreneur, a startup uh, supported by fan at the moment? Do you feel you're being support? Do you have enough support, or do you feel there's a gap for you? Like you know, you want to enter into this into this, into this industry. Um, do you feel that there's enough financial, but also uh, political and logistical support uh, for you you and your fellow other other startups in making That's a very nice transition. And thank you very much for this uh, opportunity again. Uh, we just came back from Madrid. It was the demo day for the EIT fan program of Bilbao, of the South of Europe, let's call it, the cohort. So we were one of the 10 fortune companies that were part of this uh, program of this year. We're still working, so it's not done, of course. And they say that once EIT fan member, you will always be like that. And there is a lot, indeed a lot of support. Um, so to be more precise, there are big corporations, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to, to name some of those who were actively involved and actively participating in most of the events that took place uh, online and uh, physically in both Bilbao and of course Madrid. And there's a lot of uh, tangible interest also from investors. Uh, but I will need to uh, highlight a few points that also our uh, the rest of the panel mentioned before. Uh, the agro-food or the agri-tech, let's call it, it is a high capex and low margin type of industry, if we may call it industry. So it seems to be um, with all due respect, uh, spoiled investors as of now that they're pretty excited to get their returns in just three or four years maximum. So we all have to admit and we have to agree that those, uh, the agri-tech as a sector, it is a, pay, it is a, it's a sector that requires patience. So the ESG is a new trend and it is up and coming. So we truly believe that by, by, by relying a lot on ESGs, we can play, uh, we can act this as a differentiating role that can help us as, in, as companies, as startups to um, uh, rise, thrive, and so, and welcome, of course, the innovation. But there's a main uh, challenge that we all are facing, I, guess, I dare to say. This is about uh, needing to educate and further communicate to high execs and decision-making individuals in big corporations about the several tangible and intangible elements and the benefits that uh, the big corporations may have by just um, uh, having affiliations with sm and supporting small startups like ourselves, I would say, or other, other of course, uh, more interesting and more innovative companies like ours. So ESGs, it is a tool that is being given through EIB, I would say, to most of us. 
and it makes sense to use it towards our, our common benefit. And I say common, I mean between the big corporations and the startups for the common goal of producing sustainably food raw materials or food and products. Um, also, Jessica mentioned before the two terms of deforestation and the reduction of methane that came from COP26, of course. Uh, it does make sense also to somehow highlight that uh, deforestation can be attributed also thanks to glucose. So when there are ventures, when there are companies, aside from Solmeja, that ends up producing a, a glucose substitute, let's call it, but can be used massively as a carbon substrate for uh, fermented proteins that is happening massively throughout the world. This is a promising way of how we can still ensure increasing volumes of raw materials of proteins needed for food and feed applications that without using glucose, so without further uh, cutting the trees, let's call it, as a deforestation. In reference to methane reduction, there's another thing that we could also work on. This is um, that we could also welcome by innovation, we should welcome also the intake of uh, microalgae protein isolates uh, on the as a soy sub substitute that could be also used for the animal feed ratios, lowering drastically the methane reductions of the animals, mainly the beef. So those are still some hidden uh, elements that come with the innovation that small startups are carrying with. And yes, I think that there are a lot of incentives from the European Union, from BBI, and a bunch of different organizations through the open calls that they have. And uh, I don't think I could keep uh, my talk that long, but I don't think that public-private uh, partnerships is the most important element. In my humble opinion, what makes the most important role is to incentivize the masses. It is the customers, it is the millennials, the generation Zers, the young ones who are, who are more conscious as of how they spend their money, and they do have the purchasing power to somehow define new trends or demand the change from the heavy CO2 emitters to become greener and to adapt according to the new COP26 trends, I would say, or ultimatums. Thank you, Peter. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for that. Uh, interesting, a different opinion. That's cool <laughs> to hear that. Um, but I'll, I'll just, just come back to then as start, so startups and their role in tackling the climate crisis. And obviously, we're talking about a very systemic need, need for big systemic changes. Um, Anthony's what is the actual, what do you see the role of startups in this? Obviously, he kind of described his solution and it's super interesting, could have a massive impact, uh, but how can we, how can they, as there's lots of startups in this audience, what would you say to them in terms of how they can make, a, make an impact in this kind of crisis? Okay, um, I think uh, this is also a very, very, uh, how to say, this is the elephant in the room. And uh, what I will tell you now, it's my personal opinion. Uh, I have worked with several startups, not in the food sector, as a mentor. And sometimes I am feeling that a lot of startups, they do not see the elephant in the room. What is the elephant in the room? The elephant in the room uh, is the combination of two things. First, the combination of circular economy, which is a global trend a trend that is here to stay. And second, uh, the second trend is Industry 4.0. Actually, the fourth industrial revolution uh, is a revolution that is going faster and probably more radical than all the others. The problem is that we cannot allow it to evolve like the others. All the previous industrial revolutions, they resulted in higher consumption better productivity, but at the end, much more source depletion and pollution. So our planet gets very close to its limits. We cannot allow the fourth industrial revolution to evolve like this. To put it in another way, the fourth industrial revolution, either it will be combined with circular economy, or it will create more problems that we will resolve. And that's the elephant in the room that sometimes startups avoid. There are a lot of useful startups that are getting involved in more and more optimization. But getting involved in optimizations sometimes makes you lose the big picture. It's time to reimagine, not just to optimize. It's time to reinvent, not just to improve. If I want to inspire something in the startups, is think as radical as possible. 
think as radical as the era allows, because this is a transition period that will result in a new society, in a new economy, in new politics. The period we are going through is as radical as it was the previous industrial revolution, the third one, that resulted in the states and democracies, as you know, that resulted in consumption and production systems, as you know them. Now, it's time to redesign everything until the revolution will be stabilized again. So think, inspire more, do not limit your imagination to, improve, to improvements and optimization. This is the time to redesign the whole world. That's my message for startups. Well, inspirational and, and building on that, do we have maybe any examples from any of you who you're seeing projects that are shifting and transforming the agri-food industry in this direction? Do we have any success stories, things that you are excited about that you'd like to share? Hopefully. <laughs> you ask me, Ryan. Ryan, you ask me. I ask all, all of you. Oh. If any of you have got something that you're saying, you know what? Yeah, this is something that we're seeing that is really applying what Antonis just said. Yeah, I'd be happy to go. I, you know, I, I think given what Antonis said, it, at the same time, there it needs to be rooted, what you're doing needs to be rooted in a real problem that you're solving. And so it, it's great to have a lofty vision, but you gotta start somewhere. Um, not to say that you don't want to have a big vision and be disruptive, but, you know, again, being rooted in a real problem. And so those, those are, that's kind of the, the pragmatic side of things that I, I take as a kind of from an investor lens perspective is like, are you actually solving a real, real problem here? Otherwise you could be a technology in search of a problem, um, which is obviously a very common pitfall in, in, in the entrepreneurship realm. Um, alternatively, you know, in, in some of those big disruptive areas in agriculture, we've seen a lot of investment going into vertical agriculture um, because it solves the problem of, of eliminating the variable variability that's caused by weather. You know, so, uh, you know, if, if one of the big issues of, of climate change is vulnerability to uh, extremities or extreme weather events, then how do you grow without exposure to those weather events um you know and i think that's part of the reason that we're seeing some of the the, the heavy investment in that that area um in in terms of the the ways that we're thinking about it from a plant resilience perspective uh, i think that's also informing us because growing in uh, fields is not going anywhere so what are the, if we take to be true that these extreme weather events are going to be more common what are the things that are going to be required to address uh, address those changes, so in terms of seeds that have uh, you know reduced the, the vulnerability, in terms of irrigation systems uh, in, in areas that wouldn't ever have thought about needing uh, irrigation systems, um, in terms of um, you know types of different types of inhibitors for for an, an precision medicine approach to approaches towards uh, protection in in the uh, uh, crop resilience space. Um, of course, we're seeing a lot in terms of the decarbonization and incentiviz incentivizing right. decarbonization, especially through carbon credits. That's an, an area that we've invested in and started this year in a startup called Bumitra. Um, and yeah, so I, I, th I think there's um, there's a lot of it, a lot of exciting areas, but the best ones are, are still rooted in in kind of solving a, a, a core problem. For someone and, and i actually you know in terms of this next phase of industrial revolution i don't want us to compromise on on consumption and i don't think it's realistic to expect anyone to compromise on, on energy consumption or anything like that um what we need is those, those revolutions that are going to enable that consumption because we're in order to, to reduce you know we, we need to basically change humanity an inherent characteristic of humanity which i philosophically don't see happening was that a hand up Vasilis? or was just a yeah i would yeah. prefer out of yeah. respect to be the last one to talk so i don't know if jessica wants to listen and comment or it can be me i can i can speak to a innovation that i don't yet see happening or not an innovation it's a it's mm -hmm. an idea um 
and some of the problems and checks and balances as an example, I think of, of the fact that um, this isn't just about technology, this is also about thinking about people, about structures, about incentives. Um, so one um, solution that Feedback has done a lot of research on is the use of inedible food waste streams in animal feed. Um, and the fact that actually, if you had a food system, you know, in an ideal world, you had a food system where um, we produced certain limited numbers of livestock fed on food that would, could not be used to feed people. So you can't use it for its optimal um, purpose. Uh, there's actually a smaller land footprint for a food system like that than an entirely vegan food system, which often surprises people because they see kind of, you know, veganism is like the, uh, I guess, the low consumption answer to some of the sustainability problems we face. It's clear that we do need to eat a lot, lot less meat um, and that a livestock on leftovers model would have to go alongside those kind of reductions. But it would also have to go alongside um, a very strong framework to ensure that you don't incentivize the creation of waste because it becomes um, a value stream into a new business model. And I think that's the question that always comes to me when I hear about these kind of um, projects that are maybe focusing on one very narrow part of a system and how to optimize it, how to make it better. How do you ensure that that optimization does not create a problem in and of itself? So great to displace soy from animal feed to reduce pressure on forests, on land use. Uh, great to be able to produce um, some meat that's produced in a sustainable way, fed on um, inedible food waste. But how do you prevent that driving a um, driving the market for food surplus and preventing the reduction in food waste in the first place. Um, so <laughs> this is the reason I'm not a business person and I'm a campaigner, that these questions <laughs> are always in my mind. Um, and I think it's important to have those kind of checks and balances in mind as well. Go ahead, visitors. And then we're gonna end on a hopefully high note, but um, go ahead, visitors, quickly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Am I? Yeah, go ahead. yeah, go ahead. So jumping on Jessica's uh, concern about the food waste, uh, I dare to say that uh, through our vertical microalgae farming, we have an intention to have the most sustainably produced food proteins with the lowest possible carbon, water, and land footprint. Of course, you understand the land because of vertical. You can understand the water by recirculating and reusing the water with full of nutrients. And again, coming back on the waste, uh, uh, food waste, we focus on aqua sites, from aqua culture, from fisheries, dead bones, uh, dead heads, um, fins, the tails of the fish. We take those ones and the bones, of course, and we try to valorize them to the maximum possible way. That way, we retrieve the required nutrients to feed slash fertilize our algae. So, with our concept, uh, with one bird, we have to hit two stone. With one stone, we hit two birds. Excuse me. First, we fixate CO2, so we tackle the climate crisis, and we produce our food as sustainable as possible by, as I say, valorizing the aquaculture side streams by retrieving the nutrients needed for end sustainable food production of microalgae. So I hope that there is a lot of innovation. We have our patent committee with Denmark Technical University. So as long as there are several incentives and initiatives from our own end, we can make it happen. Great. Okay. So thank you very much for these answers. Really, really interesting discussion, but we have to actually bring this discussion to a close. So. What I'd like to have from all the panelists um, is just kind of a last word, a kind of a, a message to the audience. Um, kind of, yeah. What's your? I guess also the question of the poll is like, you know, is are we is the agri food industry capable of actually transforming uh, the, of the necessity? Trans can it transform so that we can tackle climate change or not? And yeah, what what action is needed? So. I asked three things there, <laughs> so if you can answer maybe two of the three, I don't know, don't mind. Um, I can leave it to George first. Do you want to try to say a few last words? All right, yeah, no, I mean, it, just in closing, I, it, we're always keen to, to meet other investors and, and other other founders, um, and so feel free to reach out to me at george.roche, uh, it's my first name, that last name, at yara.com, uh, or, or reach me out, or reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, we, you, you kind of in, inherently have to be an optimist in order to, to be in this game, to be a founder or to be an investor. Um, and 
So absolutely optimistic about the future and uh, building solutions towards the a more sustainable future. So um, yeah, happy to, to be in touch with uh, anyone who's looking to, to build that vision. Wonderful, cool. Uh, Jessica. Okay, I'm going to um, continue in the, the campaigner role and say I think this isn't about optimism or not optimism. <laughs> I think it's about the work and the structures and ultimately how we make um, the outcomes that we want um, democratically accountable. Because I think we've seen over the last 20, 30 years that a market solves mentality is, is not going to solve many of the kind of collective issues that we face from climate change to any of the any of the problems that um, Antonis mentioned earlier. Um, I think there's an interesting parallel in the world of climate governance and kind of CO2 removals and the idea of putting mirrors into space or acidifying the oceans to slow down um, uh, global warming. What are the governance structures that are really going to um, take innovation, take technologies, take private sector investment and make them work for the wider good. Nice. Cool. Um, Vasilis. Okay. So uh, among the many companies we saw also on the demo days of the EIT Codexity Network, there were also the opportunities for organic, for, uh, for treating of organic wastes for fertilizing, of course. So this is uh, the definition of circular economy as those companies uh, were establishing and explaining to us all. So I, I if, well, as a closing note, I think that it must be some patience from the VCs or the corporate VCs uh, to give us some extra time because of the high capex and the low margin and see if the ESGs can by themselves be enough to make the, to, to bring several collaborations with heavy CO2 emitters, with big corporations, and of course the money that exists already in the market to help us uh, further innovate and incentivize the remaining ones. Nice. Okay, and I'll leave the last word. Uh, very brief. I think that we are in a period similar to the one that in 20 years, horse carriages were uh, substituted completely by cars. This resolved the big problem of horse manure in big cities and created the new problem we know now of air pollution. What I want to, to, to mention straightforward is that uh, the problem to horse manure did not come from the ones that knew a lot about horses, but from a new, completely new industry that disrupted the whole transport, transportation system. We are in such a period and the magnitude of change within the next 10 years will be relevant or even bigger than the change, the technological change we faced in the last 60 years. Fasten your seatbelts and be ready to fly. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. Wow. Um, well, thank you to all the panelists. Um, very diverse expert opinions there, uh, bringing in fresh perspective. Really appreciate that. Uh, we'll be going shortly to the first networking. Um, and you might have a chance to interact with with the panelists you just spoke to uh, and with each other in the audience. So we'll do that in a moment. Before, As we do, we'd like to open the next poll um, where we will ask you the question, which is, again, we talked about the COP26 in Glasgow. It's happening right now. So we want to think, what are the policymakers there? What should they be uh, prioritizing in the food system to make sustainable changes that we believe, that you believe, will lead to the required reduction of the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I think you can select, it's multiple choice, you can select maybe one, two, or even three of the options there. Keen to hear what you've got to say. Um, and as you're doing that, we will explain, or Laurie will explain to you a little bit about the how the network is going to work. Hey, stuff. Yeah, so hopefully you can answer those questions. Um, so we're going on to the speed networking session now. Um, so this session now will be around 15 minutes. So we're a bit over time, sorry about that. Uh, the discussion was too interesting to stop, unfortunately, uh, and fortunately at the same time, I guess. Um, so during this 15 minute uh, networking session, we're gonna give you two sessions within the session. So you're gonna have two chances to meet different people uh, from, from the participants. Um, so it can be, it's gonna be random. 
you're not going to be forced to speak to them. So we're not forcing anyone to do anything here in this on this platform. Uh, but you're going to have the option to speak to someone that you may not have ever connected with before. So we're all about trying to connect people that don't normally or wouldn't think of connecting. And potentially there could be something that comes out of it. So please have an open mind and, you know, try to connect with the person that's offered to you and then see what happens. You know, you might find out something very interesting for them. Um, if it doesn't go well, you can then kind of leave it and that's fine, but um, give it a chance and hopefully you'll, you'll learn something new and you'll be able to find out something interesting from this. Um, really want here to be, you know, try to think about what kind of collaborations that could happen, what kind of things you could do together that could help us tackle climate change, basically in the end, maybe indirectly, maybe directly, who knows? Um, so let's see how it goes. And once you really try and enjoy it, you'll see on the left hand side of the screen, there's a button saying networking. Um, that's where you need to go. Uh, and then someone will be assigned to you and then you can accept it based on that, um, basically. Um, how is the polling going? Are we, are we, have we got some answers for you? For everyone? I think we can share, share the answers after the, the networking, I believe. Um, I feel uh, at the end of the day that we're here as part of the EIT Food Accelerator Network. So let's get that networking going. And after the networking, we'll then get a chance to meet the startups. So, which is very exciting. Exactly. So uh, enjoy the networking. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed some uh, networking. There's. Um, that's what we're all a big part of what we're trying to achieve here in the EIT Food Accelerator Network, of course, is not only empowering uh, startups and the ecosystem, but ensuring that there's potential to, to find interesting people and organizations uh, to collaborate. Actually, in the audience, we did a quick look. We've got around, from all of you out there, around 25% of you are actually startups. Uh, another 20% are, are from across the food industry. Uh, things like the Food Scale Hub and the Applied Knowledge Network and different alliances that we're seeing. 70% of the uh, audience out there are actually corporates, uh, some CEOs, some consultants, analysts, R&D people. We've got about 13% of the audience are academics, students, researchers, professors. 12% uh, of the audience are actually venture capitalists, investors. 6% of the audience are in research and another 5% are, are public organizations like universities and um, environmental institutions. So welcome to all of you. It's a very diverse audience, which is great because uh, that leads to uh, to the best types of innovations. So we're now going to go into and actually give you all a chance to meet the startups. So the way this is going to work is we're going to have two 30-minute sections, okay? So the first one's about to start now. Uh, you'll have a chance to go to the, to the expo area. So on hop in on the left there, you'll be able to go to expos. It's already open, actually. So if you know what you're doing, you can go in already. The idea is at the first 10 minutes, the startup videos will be live. So you've got six startups. We've got Earth Rover, AgVolution, uh, AgriStar Bio, uh, Biotic, um, Norbite, and Y Waste. Uh, you'll be able to go in there and see a little caption of who they are. And from the six startups, you can choose probably two or three of their videos to watch in that first 10 minutes. And after watching their videos, we'll then give you a chance to go and talk to the startup that you choose to talk to. You might start trying to talk to all six of them. <laughs> You'll have 20 minutes. You might try and just talk to one of them or anything in between. It's your choice. Decide where you want to spend your time. Now will take us for the next 30 minutes. So 10 minutes of the videos to see who these startups are. Then choose who you want to spend your 20 minutes with. All of them, one of them, some of them. And then at 5 p.m., more or less, in 30 minutes' time, 5 p.m. Central um, European time, we'll do it again. So the videos that you didn't get to watch, you'll have a chance to watch the other startup videos. And the startups you didn't have a chance to talk to, or the ones you still want to talk more to, you'll have that chance as well. So that's how it's going to work. Uh, I think we can begin now. Okay. Well, uh, I think we had some technical hiccups there, clearly, uh, with the expo room. I think everyone got the chance to watch the videos, which are very cool videos. And as you can see from those videos, there's six amazing fan startups here with us. Um, so rather than doing the expo room, what I propose we do is actually hear from the startups here um, in the main room. So I think we have with us uh, from Earth Rover, uh, Ricard and Thomas. Uh, maybe we could start with you guys just to um, 
tell us a little bit more about what's going on at Earth Rover, what you're working on, what you guys do. And then we can have a little Q&A with the audience members that maybe want to uh, send you some questions or, or ask you a question. Hey, Ricard. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, should I support this with a presentation or just talking? No, pe people have, so people have seen your video. I think it's just a case of uh, okay. telling us a little bit about your story um, and seeing what questions we have for you. Well, I think the video who, where you have seen Thomas talking, it's a good introduction and really, um, what else to say? I mean, we are using uh, deep technology, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, advanced localization and optoelectronics. And uh, we are doing this together with renewable energy, let's say. And then we have here a combination of technology which allows us to solve some acute uh, problems for the farming industry, like weeding and like obtaining more accurate data on the crop. And by, basically, uh, this will allow farmers to reduce the CO2 footprint of, of their activity to better use the resources and to particularly uh, control weeds on a, in a very sustainable way, which is not uh, affecting the environment, not affecting the crop, respecting the soil. And it's very efficient on energy. And therefore, uh, we think that if the farmer uses uh, renewable energy to recharge the batteries of our rovers, then we have a zero carbon footprint solution. And I think that this is the, our main contribution to the sustainability aspect of, of our technology. Maybe, Thomas, you want to add something? Well, uh, not really. I think the video was very explanatory what we are doing and you recall now uh, commented a little bit uh, further. So nothing else to add unless so, there are some questions. Yeah, I mean, if we have questions coming, one from me is, um, so this stage where you're at, what, what are you looking for next in terms of support? Where do, what's your next challenge? What are you trying to do? Well, uh, the current stage is in which in which uh, part of our technology is in uh, technology readiness level 7, TRL 7. So let's say everything related with autonomous scouting. So the autonomous operation of the rover and the ability to uh, gather this crop data and upload it to, to the cloud so that it's readily available for the farmer. This is in tier 7, so we are currently finishing a pilot in England. And then we are looking to start new pilots with customers, paid pilots, if possible. So we expect to have uh, paid pilots on autonomous scouting uh, next year, ideally on the first quarter. And then the second uh, part, which is the winning technology, this is a tier of five, six, let's say transitioning from five to six, uh, we are finishing the development of the product. So we successfully tested on the field a proof of concept, which was, um, it, it has the basic functionality, but it was not fast enough, for instance, and it was covering a very small area. So now we, we are finishing our, our weeding product and uh, we expect to present it to the world um, beginning of December at FIDA, which is a um, agricultural robotics uh, conference in Toulouse in the 7th of December to be more precise. And we are, well, we are there. <laughs> we expect to be able to finish it on time. So we are doing quite well with this new product. And we expect then next year to finish the development and, and, and move into TR7 and start pilots uh, later in the year. 
on this uh, breakthrough winning technology. And that's it. So we expect by 2023 to be really fully commercial, let's say, to have gone through all the external validation of our products and start uh, moving into brick event and growing. So this means that we are looking for money, basically. And then we are on a seat round now. So we are looking for investors to invest, uh, roughly speaking, 2 million in the company for the next two years. Let's say that would cover the development and initial commercialization in the next two years, 2022 and 2023. Very clear ask. Thank you. I think mean, that's important. We have, we have clarity on, on where you're going and, and what you're what you need to get there. Um, wonderful. And as I said, there's a really interesting audience here, diverse audience. So um, those of them, those of you in the audience who are interested, uh, you know who Earth Rover are. Uh, you know how you've got their contact details within Hopin, so you can definitely reach out to them. Uh, any final message from Ricardo Thomas to the audience right now? Thomas, Thomas, actually, Thomas. Uh, well, just thank. Uh, uh, I want to thank you all of the eight fun demo, the demo day uh, organizers. Uh, it was quite an experience to make the video. Uh, I'm not very used to that. I hope uh, people enjoyed the video. Thanks to Somos Road, uh, they edited the video quite well. Uh, the raw material was not that good, um, but uh, just. Um, we are continuously working on on having and uh, trying to to make this this future pure proof uh, agriculture and sustainable agriculture uh, uh, the norm and, and to have uh, more available uh, organic agriculture so we can help a little bit the planet to to go better in the future great message that's what we need thank you guys appreciate it keep doing what you're doing yeah thank you thank very much to you Awesome. Um, so next we'll hear from Andreas Agvolution. Welcome, Andreas. Using yeah, those hi. the video, we'll know that Agvolution are there delivering the best data and forecasting services for profitable and climate friendly planet cultivation. Right, Andreas? Yes, that's right. Uh, because um, it's just the thing that we have not um, a soil moisture database, for instance, and how do we know um, how our plants grow if we don't know about the soil moisture? Because a big part of the plant is growing under the surface. And if we don't know about it, then we have a problem there. And that is what we are solving. Nice. So where are you in your in your kind of scale up journey? <clears throat> yeah, we started uh, over uh, nearly three years ago. Um, started to develop the soil moisture sensor and an IoT device, which is able to measure microclimate within the plant canopy, but also within the ground, as mentioned. And we use this data in our own uh, ecosystem model. Um, it's designed to predict, uh, which is a limiting factor uh, in plant growth, so that we know if uh, is there a nutrient deficiency or is um, not enough water available. Um, this is the questions um, the, the farmers ask themselves uh, every day. And the speciality in agriculture is that we have large fields and that we need to know uh, these kind of uh, answers uh, for every field, for every field site, especially. And that is uh, the challenge here. And therefore, you need a scalable model, which is trained by valuable data sets, um, especially concerning soil moisture um, data. And then you are able to predict um, which risk occur on the fields and which risk can damage your crops and can lead to inefficiencies. And that is basically what we're doing here. Yeah, speaking <clears throat> from a personal knowledge and experience, right, as a, as a farmer yourself. Yes, I'm, I'm a farmer myself and uh, I worked a few years in agriculture and there were always a problem. Um, you were, yeah, I've, I've been asked, um, yeah, what to do next? Um, how much water should I irrigate? How much fertilizer should I apply? And this is all um, these questions are um, can only be answered if you concern the climate, if you tackle, tackle this uh, issue, and if you integrate the climate um, adapted the decision support system into your um, farm management system, because the weather is uh, influencing everything. 
uh, we are doing and uh, it's influencing how efficient plants grow. So if you want to store carbon, for example, and carbon storage is no nothing else than biomass production. And um, if the climate um, is limiting this biomass production because you have not enough water or uh, there's a drought on the field, then we are not able to store carbon. Um, so that is a very, very, very challenging point. And we need to know more about our weather conditions on the field. That is where we can help. And um, yeah, I think having that empathy, knowing your uh, your end user uh, as closely as you do there, is 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 a great asset. Um, sort of final question for me, really, is and and again, the audience, anyone that wants to jump in or write a question, please do. Um, as with all the startups here, you know where to find them after today's event. So for you, Andreas, talking to this audience, which as I said, is, is full of, of, of corporates, of, of investors, of industry people. Um, what is your ask? What are you needing? What are your challenges to get you to the where you want to go? Yeah, we need to uh, find partners to resell our product because we are not focused on um, the end customer. We are focusing on B2B customers. So we're looking for partners who are actually want to sell or have a demand in a, a scalable IoT technology uh, or uh, we have a demand in uh, a service to predict uh, weather risk on every field. And this is where we're looking for partnerships. And another thing is that we, of course, um, can also um, uh, offer to help in development of uh, algorithms, can help in development of a scalable um, a model uh, for plant prediction and climate predictions. And that is also what, what we are looking for. What kind of partners are you? So what's an ideal partner, would you say? Um, do you have examples of that? Yeah, of course we have, for example, we have um, breeding companies for plants. Uh, these are perfect partners, but also resell part, uh, companies. So for example, um, we have a partnership with um, a provider of machinery to farmers. And they, they know the business model, so to say, because they have uh, run um, GNSS um, signals and GNSS systems. So it's similar to IoT. And um, um, when you ask a, a farmer what is the next thing or what is uh, the thing he needs to know, he mostly will answer um, money. But <laughs> the second answer will be that he wants to know better about the weather conditions. And so um, these, these companies, um, uh, our perfect partner to um, help the farmers to measure the climate and we can help to provide the technology. Cool. Yeah, really great. Um, it's it's so nice to, to see the journey that you guys have been on and you see with, you know, as part of EIT Food Accelerator Network over these recent months, you see the the growth and the confidence, and the network that you that you create. Um, so Good luck out there, Andreas. Uh, not that you need luck. I think you've got a clear plan. So we encourage everyone here in the audience is interested to reach out to you. Um, and I think with that, we'll be moving on now to hear from the next startup. So thank you, Andreas. Um, now we're going to hear from uh, Ben, uh, who's at Y Waste, uh, where they're eliminating food waste at the food retailers through software solutions. So at the other end of the agricultural uh, supply chain. Hi, Ben. Welcome. Oh, you're on. I don't hear you just yet. I'd mute myself. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Wonderful to be here. So, so much, some of the people have seen the video, some maybe haven't yet. So what would you share about what Why Waste are doing, your story? Yeah, as you alluded to, we're at the other end from these of the food chain from, from the previous two startups. So we deal with primarily food waste that accru occurs in retail and grocery retail specifically. Um, we... I mean, the whole team at Y Waste, we've all got retail experience. So whether it's from the shop floor, deli counter or management or supply chain management, we've all, we're all experienced in that. And we noticed that pain points and bottlenecks on the shop floor are huge drivers for waste. Like there's gaps across the, the grocery retailer where food just leaks out and it's it's not good. So what we do is we try and address that and we build, we notice that process inefficiencies are often the driver for the for the wasted food from retail so we've tried to build solutions that make processes in store 
a lot more efficient for the retailer, for the shop floor colleague, um, so that they are going about their daily work and reducing food waste at the same time. So probably the, our, our beachhead solution is called Semaphore. And if it's effectively a di digital list system, which for allows for more efficient date check management, because previously you were having to check every single product on every single shelf, which is a bit in a big hypermarket is a huge job. You've normally got a team of people and it it's a lot of time. And unfortunately, sometimes people don't do it as effectively. You get summer workers in, you get student workers. And I've, I've been there myself. I was that student worker. Just, yeah, it's OK. Let's do that. Move on. But with our system, you do the you, do, you can do the job in a shorter space of time. You can take more pride in your work and you can make sure that the, the products are following FIFO. There's nothing expired on the shelf. But if you do find a product that's close to expiry, we have a digital markdown, a dynamic pricing markdown engine that sits behind the date checking. So if we are able to sell, uh, the retailer is able to sell the product at the most optimal price that it's likely to, uh, and it will get the sale. So we feed the algorithm because it's algorithm based with as much data as we can, sales data, weather data, location data, offers in the store. Is it, have you got products that are likely to cannibalize this being sold? And we can present the optimal price that this is, this product's likely to sell at. Then we can push that product either to screens, in-store displays, um, or to consumer apps through open API. So if they if they have their own consumer facing app or they work with a third party, we can push this uh, optimal price to a third party, and we we try to do it on the product that high. If it's not sold, will have the highest environmental impact because ultimately the product with the the greatest uh, negative environmental impact is the one that doesn't sell. So we want to make sure that's sold and that is consumed. Otherwise, all the energy that's gone into producing it is has gone to waste as well. And, that, and yeah. it's hard to explain in a nutshell. It's quite, a, <laughs> but what, I think the whole process is quite simple. But it's, the the words are quite difficult to get across sometimes. But I hope that explains. I, I a think bit you. What we I do. think you captured it. Yeah. No, I think I've, uh, it is complex. Exactly. And um, and we heard today from Antonis. Uh, for sure all about the importance of reducing waste right and um yeah. and we know how much of there is uh, in that space so yeah what you're doing is key so where again where are you on your journey right now uh, as wild waste and also what region are you in where are you operating and where do you plan to operate mm -hmm. uh, so at the moment we i'll start with the, the second question first so we're based in sweden in gothenburg that's where our head office is um i'm in helsinki i run the finnish and the english speaking side of side of the business um we currently this summer and through the pandemic we've actually seen an acceleration because we've noticed that the community facing aspect there's and surplus cash has come into grocery retail because they've been allowed to stay open and we found that store owners and chains have become a lot more attentive to food waste there's a profit a bit it's a financially they become aware of it and also sustainably minded, they become aware of it. So at the moment, we now work with 35 to 40 chains across the world uh, using our systems. Um, so from chains from Brazil to New Zealand, Japan, Kazakhstan, and across Europe, uh, well, Nordic region of Europe, uh, we've just entered the Dutch and the German markets now. Um, but where we would like to grow is in Southern, Southern Europe, especially Spain, Italy, Greece, uh, the Mediterranean markets where we've had a uh, little, it's been a bit slower to penetrate from our side. What, um, what kind of barriers or challenges have you found when trying to get your solution into these stores? And Firstly, linguistic, uh, definitely mm -hmm. linguistic, because we're talking to shop floor colleagues who uh, they their English is, is good, but they want to operate in their own language and making sure that our software and the UX is up to speed in uh, na native level, say Italian or Spanish has been a challenge for us because we're Nordic based. We don't have that linguistic expertise. We've tried to find a way, we've tried to find solutions and work with partners, but that's a slow process. If a chain wants to roll out, they want that translation and it needs to be correct. It needs to be 
okay, we just haven't entered into Google Translate. It needs to be, okay, this is ha this is the terminology we use in the store, so it needs to be correct. We found that as a barrier. Um, but also getting the through the pandemic, not being able to travel to shows and events is where this kind of thing is, is invaluable to us to be able to communicate what we're trying to do. Because we, we, we're we building up a slow case of reference with the portfolio of references now and just being able to accelerate that into say, look, this works. We want to work with you. We want to become a partner for you in your uh, food waste and efficiency management. So you can do what you do best. We can do what we do best. Amazing. And, and just to wrap up, at least from my side, um, to, again, same question to the audience out there, the diverse audience that we have, you know, what are you guys looking for? What support do you need? Who do you want to really talk to? What's your message? Uh, so we are looking to talk to, well, as any startup, we're always going to look for investment. Uh, we we closed, a, 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 it was supposed to be a bridge round, but we closed a series A earlier this year. But now we're looking towards scaling and looking towards the US, uh, as everybody does tends to do at this, this stage. Um, anybody who's, who can help us into the Mediterranean markets would be advantageous. Or if there's any retailers listening, then reach out directly and I'll be happy to talk to you. Amazing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Um, and uh, stick fine. around because we will have at the end some more uh, networking, more one-to-one -one networking later. And all these videos, if you didn't get a chance to see the videos, don't worry. We will be showing the videos uh, at the end of today's session. Uh, so you'll get to see them because there's some great stuff to see there. So you get to see all six of the startups. Okay, so um, next we're going to be talking to um, Natalie. So. Hello. Hi, Natalie. How are you doing? Fine. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so tell us about the, uh, the work that you guys are doing. <clears throat> so at Norbite, we upcycle plastic waste into healthy food solutions with the help of insects. So we have uh, this specific insect, the Gritovac moth, which is able to digest commonly used plastics. And we have developed a technology which enables the insects to digest more than 80% of commonly used plastics, which means that we um, are not competing with recycling industries. We are just complementing them with all those lasting waste streams where there are mixtures and copper mass and whatever it can be uh, recycled uh, otherwise and that our insect can digest, which is really nice and it's really natural solution for this very huge problem. <laughs> and at the end of the process, the larvae are processed and healthy and nutritious proteins and lipids are obtained for food and feed industries. So it's really circular model of the company. And uh, I would say the combination of uh, utilization, transformation of plastic waste, of vertical farming process to grow the insect and quality of uh, end products make the whole process extremely sustainable. And uh, there is a new term uh, just uh, that popped up a few days ago about gigacorn potential. And I think that our company is clearly in this uh, uh, field of uh, really important impact in terms of reduction of uh, CO2 equivalents. Absolutely. You guys are at the forefront here of, of a very young and new um, type of innovation. So it's great to see it's really breakthrough innovation you know, from something. And, and have you found challenges maybe around regulations not being up to speed with what you're doing or has that been OK for you? So the sector is very re regulated one. Yeah. So the food sector is regulated, the feed sector is regulated. So there are uh, some work that have been already done by uh, our colleagues from other insect industries. So the uh, pet food industry is uh, widely open. For the uh, biofertilizers, there is a new regulation now that uh, we need to comply with, but it's uh, already existing to feed our insects to our monogastric animals in aquaculture, poultry and pigs. There is a regulation that uh, does exist, but it's not yet include our insect, but it's uh, already something that is uh, a, a great step forward that has been done. And even a few insects now are um, accepted by uh, EPSA within the EU to be fed to, uh, to humans. So the regulations are moving and uh, uh, we are going <clears throat> in the right direction here. 
clearly. So at Norbite, um, in terms of transforming these plastics, is is it all types of plastics or specific types of plastics at this stage? Uh, all the plastic that we, that we have tested up to now were transformed. So I wow. cannot say which were transformed all of them because there are too many different kinds, <laughs> but everything that we have tested, it, it's working. And I would say it's it, cool. it's really because it's a complex system inside the insect because it's symbiosis mm. between the inner enzymes of the insect and the uh, whole micro um, uh, whole ecosystem of microorganisms of their gut. So actually, those microorganisms mm -hmm. they adapt according to the plastic that they are feeding on, and the enzymes of the insect are accelerating the process. So it's a real I would say ecosystem of transformation of this type of materials. Amazing. It's fascinating. <laughs> So we don't need to worry about plastics anymore. It's solved, right? <laughs> <laughs> more <At> more plastic. <laughs> <laughs> At least we're trying to work on that. That's great. Absolutely. So um, and where is this happening? I mean, again, regionally, where are you doing this and, and where do you aim? Where's your target market? So uh, currently we are based in, uh, in Sweden, in Stockholm. So uh, the idea is to, to race from there. To, to start building uh, um, pilot and demonstration units in, in, in Sweden, when commercial units may be also in the Nordics, and they're rising all around the, the Europe and even a wider one <laughs> afterwards. I like the ambition, absolutely. I mean, these guys are all moving to Mars now as well, so keep that on your radar. <laughs> So what um what are uh, what are you seeing though as you, as your challenge? What's blocking you? What's slowing you down? What do you need to happen to speed you up? So there are different types of challenges uh, that remains, obviously, in terms of tech, in terms of, of commercial development, in terms of uh, finances. So currently we are raising our seed round of 2 million euros. So if there are some investors that are interested, <laughs> didn't hesitate to get in touch. And <clears throat> uh, I think that we are moving all those different aspects together uh, in order to uh, have the equilibrated development of the company. So tech, commercial development, financial development. Uh, there was also uh, increasing of the team, which is um, foreseen in the coming months. So we are trying to, to get all of it together and um, to, to, to have this sustainable development of a company. Amazing, Natalie. Uh, I think we'll wrap up there, uh, but a really clear message. And to build on what you're saying, in terms of reaching out through the Hopin platform, you can uh, click on, if you go to where the people are, um you can anyone in the audience is able to click on another person and you can see who they are maybe look at their linkedin and you can send them a message um and, and connect them that way so that people like natalie if you've just seen what norbite are doing which is really exciting and all the other startups uh, you can directly directly get in contact so thank you natalie thank you so now we're going to hear from uh, addy at uh, biotic so Biotech are the creators of fully uh, bio-based and biodegradable PHA polymer uh, manufacturing process. So, hey, Addy, how are you doing? Uh, I don't hear you. You're on mute, I think. Yeah, thanks. There we Great go. to be here. Yeah, now you can hear me. Yeah. yeah, so tell us a little bit about the story. What are you guys doing? So uh, at Biotech, um, we want to... We envision a world where plastic is no longer a concern so that we can, you know, continue to purchase plastics, but then throw it away and it will fully biodegrade. And the way we do it is uh, we use marine biomass, um, currently a green seaweed. Uh, we extract carbon source out of it, feed it into a, a microbial fermentation process. And those, those microorganisms uh, produce a polymer. Uh, that we then extract and this polymer uh, we can control and modify its characteristics so it can fit anything from very flexible to very ruggedized and anything in between of course um, and uh, we look at the circular economy process or a circular process overall we, we extract valuable byproducts uh, throughout the entire process uh, that could be highly digestible proteins, uh, biostimulants, uh, colorants, lipids, and other smaller molecules that can serve other industries. Why would uh, provide so it? Why would targeting it animal waste? Sorry. Uh, because we don't, you know, agriculture is in a, in a problematic situation. Using uh, agriculture to try and replace plastic is has limits of scalability. 
Uh, so that's one aspect. The other one is, you know, use of, of water, fresh water, treated water for growing it. When you look at algae, no need for any water uh, irrigations uh, to, to do that. Uh, we also use uh, saline water in our, pro in our uh, fermentation process, so we can take the algae as is. We don't need to clean it and, you know, we can absorb the, the, the salts. Um, and it grows all year long um, in every ocean and can be harvested very quickly. Uh, it's not seasonal, like algae-based um, materials. Uh, so there are a lot of advantages. These are the, just the, the high-level ones. Uh, we, we target to, to, to reach the same or similar price to fossil-based plastics. So all the approaches that we take is towards this, reducing energy costs, reducing consumption of, uh, of land and, uh, and water, and not competing with arable land, food, and animal feed. Yeah. What's the current cost uh, compared to plastic? Well, we are still in development, we are, so we are we are in a very small scales. Uh, mm -hmm. We target uh, we target to be at about one one and a half two dollars a kilo when we reach to the kilogram uh, stages uh, in the next uh, few months. We are we are currently there? raising our seed round uh, that okay. will allow us the the expansion and the scaling up. Uh, How does that compare to plastic? The price of plastic? Well. Price of plastic that we refer to is about one dollar a kilo, mm. though it's it has increased in the last uh, year yeah. or so uh, drastically. So I've already hear, heard from customers that they pay uh, also one point five dollars a kilo. So we're really, you know, following the market, and uh, you know, we want to achieve a seamless transition. And uh, we believe that it will only be happen, possible if you have a scalable alternative that can replace. 400 million tons of plastics potentially in, in 10, 15, 20 years, but also price competitive so that uh, it, it will be a drop-in alternative for, for the customers. Cool. Uh, what are your, I guess, same question, similar questions to the startup. What are your challenges to get to that? Because obviously you want to seed round, but are there other challenges, you know, you need the investment to be able to develop this product, uh, but you see any challenges in terms of your target client or what you're actually building, what kind of challenges do you have right now? To get to well, I think that, you know, other than uh, having the seed round finalized, uh, as a side note, I would say it's a, it's a $2 million round that we are doing now, equity round. Uh, but uh, it's, a norm, you know, biological processes has the challenge of, of scaling up. Uh, I think we do a lot of uh, steps and, and stages to mitigate this and make sure that we are on the right path to that. Uh, but it's it's uh, these are this is the the the, the challenge uh, from customer side the product side I don't think that we have any you know hard challenges so um, hopefully within the next couple of months we will be able to show the scaling up uh, ability and then uh, we are off the you know to the market. Brilliant. So do you have any yeah. messages or requests from the from the participants audience um anything you'd like to kind of any call to action from them i well i think uh, we, we look at uh, at, uh, at all of this new ecosystem that is built around plastic alternatives and and it's very adjacent to other industries and and from our side we are happy to speak with anybody being somebody that does alternative plastics uh somebody like natalie that is doing you know the other side of uh, of uh, of the plastic um, uh, needs uh, partners companies corporates that are using plastics and want to work with us to make sure that uh, the plastics the biological plastic fits the need the machines and that we, they can actually do it uh, uh, in a in a drop in solution and uh, of course uh, investors and, and VCs uh, or academic or uh, you know research institution we are happy to speak with everybody share our experience and, and, and knowledge and get information from whoever wants to share Brilliant. I love the openness that's exactly the spirit of fan I believe it's an ecosystem um, that needs to be built in order for everybody to strive I think we need to replace a market that exists for uh, you know decades and it's not going to be easy if we're not a group Brilliant. Great message. And I think that goes for all the startups, I believe, as you say, you want to connect with all the startups too. Um, it's a message that making innovations, we're always pushing. So it's great to hear from the startups too. Yes, yeah, so exactly. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. And thank you for having me. No worries. Great. Thank you, Adi.
So uh, we're going to hear from one more startup, um, which is we're going to hear from Pedro AgriStar Bio. So welcome, Pedro. So AgriStar Bio, they're the creators of organo mineral fertilizer from biosolids of livestock or municipal water treatment solutions. So great to have you here. Thanks. And I'd uh, love to hear a little bit more about your story. Tell us what you're up to. Well, um, we are, we are um, at, at this moment. Um, do you want to know how we started or where we are right now? Both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> actually, uh, we, we, we started developing the technology uh, on, on paper and projects. Then we, we developed our, um, our own uh, pilot reactor. And this reactor, what it, what it enables us to do is take the organic biologic sludges from uh, municipality water treatment plants, from livestock, um, and, uh, and transform it uh, into organic mineral fertilizer. And while doing that, we do it in very small facilities, so under 2,000 square meters, uh, allowing us to produce it very close to a source of organic waste and uh, produce organic mineral fertilizer, but recycling all organic matter and all nutrients are in there. Uh, also, uh, the treatment that we do to it is, um, uh, uh, is, uh, allows us to have a more efficient fertilizer as the nutrients and the organic matter uh, blend in this chemical reaction that sterilizes the, the organic waste. At the same time, it makes it a more nutrient efficient fertilizer in terms of release to the soil, less losses to the atmosphere, especially from nitrogen, uh, less losses of, uh, of nutrients to the water streams. So we are increasing efficiency significantly in terms of nutrients and, and, and reducing significantly also the impact in the environment. Uh, we, we did recently some tests with a with the uh, fertilizer that we actually licensed to sell in Portugal. And uh, we saw that uh, as we put more and more of this fertilizer, the, the soil does not acidify. And so this is pretty key for uh, both uh, uh, the in environmental impact of uh, uh, nitrogen rich fertilizer, but also in terms of the efficiency of the fertilizer has, if the soil is in between a certain brackets of efficiency, uh, then uh, the plant grabs a lot more of the nitrogen and goes faster. So it's both in improving uh, the yields of the, of the plants and saving the, the environment, uh, the water streams and the atmosphere. So it's very interesting because we kind of, everything kind of uh, goes, comes together. And uh, it, it's very much like we saw uh, a while ago uh, with the Antonis uh, presentation. We are talking about circular economy what you call the elephant in the room. We are a perfect example of circular economy in, in mixing uh, the organic waste uh, um, uh, industry with the fertilizer industry. And we are doing a fertilizer that is substituting the chemical fertilizer, not as much as you usually see uh, some kind of compost of biodigesture or something like this. We are doing a, a sub NPK fertilizer that, that we can adjust the balance of these nutrients so making it spot on for a certain kind of crop, for a certain kind of uh, 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 food, feedstock, for, uh, I mean, different kinds of soil. So it's very, very interesting a kind of uh, Lavoisier approach to fertilization. <laughs> it's, it's super innovative. It's very disruptive um, what yes. you're doing. Uh, so fantastic that that we have people like you and organizations like agristar bio focused on this yes. um no really cool pedro and what um what do you see then as well firstly where are you focused right now uh in terms of regionally where you where you what markets are you trying to grow into okay so um we are uh, at the moment uh, very close we actually already defined the chronogram for the kickoff of the first unit uh, with a, with a company, with a paper pulp company called Altri. Uh, and uh, they will be, uh, they, we, we have, we'll find both customers for our solution in the organization. So we, we have the, the organic uh, biologic uh, uh, sludge from the paper pulp factory and they manage around 1,000, 
100,000 hectares of forest. So they will do, we will do a complete circular economy approach on this. So making the organic waste, the fertilizer that they will use in the forests. So this is real circular economy within an organization. And this is very, very interesting. We have been testing with them and the plants and all, it's going very well. Going, looking at the markets, we are, we are starting in Portugal because we found at least two very interesting uh, projects to, to develop here. One is the one I told you about. There's another one with, with Pixlary. Um, but we are looking geographically, we are lo we're looking very, very interestingly for countries like the Netherlands, where they have very big problem with excess nitrogen on the, on the, on the soils. Uh, and also uh, a problem because of that regarding the livestock. So, because we, when we come to a livestock producer, uh, either if it's pig slurry or dairy farm or something like this, we are giving them a complete traceable uh, destination to their organic waste. We are actually making all of it going into the fertilizer. So no losses, no emissions, no, I don't know where the waste went to. Uh, so uh, I can imagine that countries where we have more of these uh, excess nutrients, especially nitrous, nit nitrogen and phosphorus in the surrounding areas of livestock production are, are key uh, potential clients for us, making us produce fertilizer at a more competitive uh, cost. Additionally, everywhere where desertification is taken notice, we are leaving a fertilizer with almost 60% per of organic matter. The fertilizer that I told you about in the register is 58% of organic matter. In an uh, NPK 989, it's almost un unheard of. So it's uh, and, and very uh, resistant to uh, the solving uh, phosphorus from just from raining and stuff. So this is really a different uh, approach, both to the fertilizer as well. It does not acidify the soil and to the waste management. So. Uh, where we find either these two or the two together, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's the ideal match. Um, so it's, it's really nice you have a clear uh, target. So I think final question. Yes. The same thing. You know who the audience is. It's a very diverse audience. So what's your message to them? What are you looking for? What What are you trying to achieve in your next step? Well, we are looking for... Uh, for an investor, someone to co-invest with us in in the, in, in the kickoff, though we we will be co-investing with our first client in the unit specifically, but not in the parent company. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities for us to take on after this first unit, and we also need some equity to put in this first unit from our part. Um, so of course, investment is is a key issue. We're really raising. Uh, we are expecting something between two and a half to three million euros, and uh, and we will we'll kick off with well, revenues around four to five million euros uh, unit by unit. So you can expect that to grow significantly as we move on. And also, of course, since we are looking at circular economy opportunities and don't don't want to be fighting too much for market share in each market, we're also looking for partnerships for moving out of Portugal. So the Netherlands I told you about could be Spain, uh, Israel, countries where or France, where uh, agriculture and livestock have very large uh, importance, where you, you will be solving both the environmental problem of livestock and the, uh, the soil impact of excessive use of chemical fertilizers. So some kind of regenerative agriculture is, is perfect for us. <laughs> well, it's a, a very important and growing space. Um, yes. So you're in the right place at the right time. Uh, so congrats for that, Pedro. Um, thank you. And thank you to, to all of the, the startups. Um, okay. Really clear messages. I think you see here on the EIT Food Accelerator Network, uh, the FAN program, it's very diverse, both across Europe, but also all stages of the supply chain. Uh, there's a lot of innovation happening. Uh, social innovation and especially uh, sustainable environmental innovation, which is great to see. Um, before we, I think we're going to display the videos in a moment. So you, those, you'll see all of the six startups, the videos that we've been referring to, uh, which are very short and, and quite engaging. Um, I just want to say for the audience members that uh, we've heard from some amazing startups and some amazing panelists and the keynote speaker. On Hopin, if you go back to 
the reception, you'll see that everybody's contact details are there. So if you've heard from someone you really want to connect with directly, you have their LinkedIn details, you can see who they are. So you've got everything you need to, to reach out to people. Um, we'll also, as we're playing the videos, you have the option also, if you don't want to see the video, you can jump out into the networking area and again, be matched with people. Um, and you can all, you can also go to the export, uh, expo area, excuse me, to go and see the startups. So we're going to leave this open for now, I believe. You can see the videos in here. You can go to networking if you want to network with someone, or you can go to the expos to go and talk to the startups. Uh, there'll also be a couple of polls popping up. We've got some interesting questions for you. Uh, one of them, especially around, well, what are we as citizens, food citizens, going to do next? You know, we're all working in this industry, more or less. Uh, majority of us are. What actions can we take to really help tackle the climate crisis in our roles in agriculture and food? So we've got a poll asking about to think about that, too. Um, yeah. Nice one. Laurie? I mean, we just to let you know as well, time wise, um, the sessions will be closing at 630. So there is a there is a end game. Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, but obviously, you can then try to connect with whoever you're talking to outside of Hopin. Um, yeah, hopefully everyone has enjoyed uh, the session today. Um, and also the, the platform that uh, we're using today is a bit different to last year, we were using Zoom, like everyone else was. Uh, hopefully this was a good experience for everyone. Um, and we'll continue on this track uh, into the next demo dose. So got some interesting demo dose coming up, uh, one on the 11th and another one on the 25th. Um, and about very much focused on technology and how it's trying to transform agriculture and agri-food agri in general. Um, and so hopefully see you there too. Um, we have other startups uh, presenting and very much focused on different challenges that the agri-food sector is facing. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone. And uh, we'll see you soon. Enjoy the networking. Hi, I'm Adi Goldman, CEO and co-founder of Biotic. We envision a world where plastic is no longer a concern in which we purchase a product in the exact same way and after use, tosses it to any trash without the need to sort or recycle. Did you know that only 9% of global plastic consumption is being recycled? The rest ends up in landfill or find its way to our natural resources and we end up consuming it on a daily basis through our food, air and water. Biotech provide a circular, fully bio-based PHA polymers manufacturing process using marine biomass as feedstock for a precise fermentation process, targeting to provide optimal alternative to fossil-based plastics. Our polymers fit a wide range of application. We use untreated saline water in the process, reducing energy cost and contamination risks. We extract valuable byproducts to ensure minimal to zero waste. And closing the circle, our polymers fully biodegrade back into CO2 and water. Compared to PLA polymers, which requires industrial compost to biodegrade, PHA polymers biodegrade in any environment and is the biggest contributor towards the growth of bioplastic towards degradability with an expected growth rate of 40%. As a commodity manufacturer producing bioplastic pellets or flakes, we see our customer range across all industries. Our thermoplastic polymers fit anything from very ruggedized to very flexible products and anything in between. Our initial focus is towards crucial industry pain points, food and beverage packaging, consumer goods, single use and medical disposables. Moving forward, our polymers are applicable for a wider range of applications. Currently, most of the bioplastic ecosystem use terrestrial resources and fresh or treated water, which leads to high cost and tend to provide a niche solution. While we target competitive costs to fossil-based plastics, we also offer sustainable solutions for today's industry biggest holdback through the ability to modify and control the polymer's characteristics, using marine biomass, which is already naturally grown all along in every ocean, has a positive environmental effect and does not compete with arable land, and finally, fitting to existing production line and industrial needs to ensure seamless transition. Our team brings together a shared passion for the environment and extensive experience from various fields, including marine biotechnology, metabolic and mechanical engineering, precise fermentation, regulation, business and scaling up. We also have experienced members in our advisory board, which contribute in various complementary aspects. We have successfully accomplished lab-scale polymer production and a bioreactor process, scaling up by 100, 
and are working on process optimization to increase efficiencies and reduce costs. We are currently conducting pilots with Fortune 500 companies, are in developed discussions with additional industry leaders, and finalizing our sit down. We believe that collaboration with strategic partners will ensure seamless industrial fit and rapid market adaptation. We are happy to further speak with you and present what we do. Thank you very much. Norbite upcycles plastic waste into healthy food solutions. So let's start with plastic waste. We all know that this is a huge problem, but what we sometimes forget is that plastic is not only packaging, it's also textile, a different piece of furniture, and altogether it represents more than 300 million tons of waste per year. But at the same time, our current intensive agricultural systems fail to feed the world population in a sustainable manner. And both these problems are urgent and present at local and global levels. And Norbite works to address these two problems simultaneously. Our solution is both inspired by nature and scientifically proven. It is based on one specific insect, the greater wax moth, and we have developed a scalable vertical farming technology which enables the insect to digest more than 80% of commonly used plastics, which means that we are tackling one of the biggest issues within the waste treating industries, which is mixtures, copolymers, and last in waste streams where everything that can be recycled has been already taken out, with the only destination of the converse last in waste streams which have been the incineration. Yet, it's worth to know that each and every kilogram of incinerated plastic liberates 2.5 kg of CO2 in our atmosphere, while our process is fixing 67% of this CO2. By the end of the transformation, we obtain high-quality and nutritious ingredients such as proteins and lipids for food and feed, and even the feces, the poop of the insects, is used as biofertilizers, making this process a perfect example of circular economy. By using plastic waste as raw material, Vertical farming technology for breeding the insect and having high quality end products. The upcoming uh, industrial facility will be saving up to 120,000 tons of CO2 per year. The high technicity of our solution was validated by the biggest experts in the field, the European Space Agency, as we entered the SIPIC program. The purpose of our company was validated by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology as we successfully graduated from the AT fund where we met many of our customers and early adapters. Norbite has developed a disruptive technology which enables a real breakthrough in our way of handling plastic waste and upcycling it into healthy food solutions. A real moth effect on circular economy. My name is Ben Holden and I'm the International Sales and Marketing Manager for Why Waste AB. Why Waste are a Swedish-based food tech startup that use data-driven solutions to help food retailers reduce food waste in-store in a profitable way. We all know that food waste is a huge issue that everybody in the world is facing. The well-known stat is that if food waste were equivalent to a country, it would be the third highest emitter of greenhouse gases. Additionally, there is a huge wasted value in the food that then turns to waste. Last year, the value of the wasted food amounted to 78 billion euros globally, which is just staggering and so wasteful of us. At Why Waste, we build solutions that help the retailers, both an individual entrepreneur or a franchise owner or at chain level. We build these solutions that help them reduce food waste from their stores. So. We identify pain points on a shop floor that can be drivers for food waste. The solutions we have at the moment are digital date checking, uh, order of procurement, uh, business analytics uh, to identify why products are being sold or not being sold and being put to waste, and a solution for deli counters and traceability to be able to make sure you don't lose open food within the store. With these solutions, with our partners, so around 40 different retail chains across the world, we've seen a reduction on average of 50% with some stores being higher, 
some stores have been a little bit lower, but on the whole, we are seeing a dramatic decrease in the amount of food waste which is being produced from retailers. But we couldn't do this alone, and that's where EIT comes in and the value placed on collaboration. We know that across the food value chain, there are massive holes and we allow our solution to have an open API so that other solutions can plug into it. And even from the competitive landscape, we know that other startups and other companies and other retail chains that do similar software that we do, they're fighting the good fights. And through EIT and through the Helsinki cohort that we were part of this year, we've been able to create valuable connections, which will hopefully help us in the fight against food waste. Hi, I am Tomas Pieras from Earth Robot. We are on a mission to help farmers make affordable, high quality, chemical free fresh produce the new norm. Earth Rover is a deep tech startup working to make organic and sustainable farming available for all. We develop technologies based on artificial intelligence and robotics, specifically designed to address urgent problems that organic farmers face. An issue that farmers are currently facing is the lack of visibility of what is happening on their fields, which leads to overplanting. For organic broccoli, it means that up to 50% of the crop is waste. In order to deal with this, our pointer rover scans every plant to count, measure, map and monitor its growth and health. This edge process data is uploaded in real time to a cloud-based dashboard for visualization. This detailed information at individual plant level allows the farmer to make early and small-scale target interventions. These decisions help the farmer to lower the costs, increase yield and reduce waste. Another problem organic farmers face is weeding. Chemical herbicides cannot be used on organic crops, since they deteriorate the health of the soil, damage the environment and increase weed resistance. As an alternative, mechanical weeding has the disadvantage of tilling the soil. This promotes the liberation and emission of the carbon dioxide trapped in the soil to the atmosphere, making it not the best sustainable alternative. On top of that, it also damages the crop and promotes weed growth. At Earth Rover, we have developed a novel technology for weeding based on concentrated light. Our patented solution concentrates light at the mere stem of the weed, delivering enough energy to kill them. This solution protects biodiversity from harmful chemicals and does not disturb the soil, helping carbon retention. Our terrier rover uses this technology to inspect the crop and kill weeds in a flash of light. This system targets the weed with precision, without damaging the crop. Our technology design makes the light concentration safer and more accessible compared to the current laser-based weeding solutions on the market. Following our company vision, our technologies are based on highly efficient, fully electric solutions, which have zero carbon footprint when using renewable energies. So follow us in our journey to help farmers make sustainable agriculture the new norm. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andreas. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Evolution. When I grew up on a farm, I always noticed that the weather is the most challenging part in the daily life of a farmer. Weather is influencing how our plants grow, this is influencing how efficient they are growing. And we need to know how the precipitation, how the rainfall is on each field. We need to know how the microclimate is within the soil and within the plant canopy. That is the reason why we at Equolution think that climate measurement is key to address the challenges of sustainable agriculture in the 21st century. We designed one hardware system and a software component where we can actually measure the microclimate and use this data to uh, improve our prediction models to help farmers on adapting on these microclimate situations. We need to adapt on the weather conditions on any field at any time if we want to have a sustainable and healthy plant growth and if we want to mitigate the effects of climate change on our food production system. But how can we do this? How can we achieve this goal? Sure, we could use the old farmer's almanac for instance. Calm weather in June, that's corn in June. But we at Equolution think that this is not climate smart. We need a data-driven approach here in order to find the limiting factor of plant growth 
at any field at any time. That's the reason why we designed a fully integrated solution for agriculture to help farmers in adapting on the weather conditions. Our solution has two components. On the one hand we have a hardware device which is fully energy self-sufficient, which has several sensors on board. We can measure the soil moisture content in different layers, precipitation, solar radiance, temperature and the plant canopy. And this device is ready for the farmer. It's easy to use, easy to deploy. The sensor measures data and this data is transferred directly to our farmalizer system. It's an environmental intelligence which helps to adapt on the weather at any field at any time. And it helps to find the optimal amount of fertilizer on a field. It helps to find the optimal amount of water in order to keep our plants, our food sustainable and resource efficient. That is the reason why we think a data-driven approach is necessary for climate smart agriculture if we want to have a sustainable food production in the future. If we want to adapt on the weather, we need to measure the weather. It's just that easy. I'm Pedro Carreiro. I'm founding partner of Agristar Bio, an amazing company that's going to change the landscape of fertilization and waste management. In this journey, we have been supported by the EIT, both raw materials and food. And it's been an amazing experience with them. They have been the right partner for us to reach to the right people and bring our company closer to the market. Agastar Bio was born to solve two major environmental problems in today's world. First, the intensive use of chemical fertilizer that is damaging the soil, water and atmosphere and fix the defective way organic waste is being managed that is polluting water streams and atmosphere. Agistar Bio, we developed a revolutionary organic mineral fertilizer that creates a new scale of sustainability and circular economy. It is unique in its production process because it allows for significant reduction of carbon footprint by recycling all organic matter and nutrients with no emissions or side streams. It is installed in very small uh, facilities near the organic waste source. Uh, and it all the process is done in less than three hours. It is also unique in its behavior in the soil, given its very high mineralized organic matter content. It's high resistance to leaching or volatilization of nutrients to the atmosphere and it's a promoter of the microbiology on the soil. It is also unique in its formulation flexibility, allowing us for customized solutions for different kinds of plants and soil. Finally, it is unique in its economic sustainability because by solving two problems, it generates two sources of revenue, making us not only environmentally sustainable, but also economically sustainable. So, thanks a lot. Uh, I hope you join us in Agristar Bio, making agriculture sustainable and productive now. Well, um, those who are here in the main room, I hope you enjoyed seeing a bit more about the startups. As I said before, you know where to reach them. Um, thank you for joining this uh, EIT Food Accelerator Network demo day. Again, thanks to all the panelists and to the keynote speaker and especially the startups. And we'll see you at the next demo day uh, next Thursday, 11th of November. Well, um, 